this week on the Back Table Podcast. I think one of the things that's really exciting that potentially could help us are these devices that engineers are looking at that are wearable that potentially could let us know about the hemodynamic state before we're behind the eight ball, because that's the issue, right? Is that oftentimes when we we recognize it, that patient could be already behind the eight ball and we're trying to catch up. And so I think that would be like an amazing thing. So patients would come in, they would be laboring or they could be in the operating room and they would wear some sort of optical device that's looking at that volume and hemodynamic states, and that could sort of clue us in, hey, your patient, you know, is going to be in trouble. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable OBGYN podcast, your source for all things obstetrics and gynecology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. So we have two guests on today, Dr. Roxanne Rampersad. Am I pronouncing it correctly, Roxanne? That's correct. Yep. Okay. And Dr. Tony Shanks. So both uh, OBGYNs, and I'll let them give some introductions, and we'll talk about topic today, obstetrical hemorrhage. So I know it's a part of some interventional radiology practice, some people not, but it's a good topic, and we're going to get some of the OBGYN perspective and kind of dig into this a little bit more. So Roxanne, can we start with you? Sure. So, Roxy and Ron Prasad, maternal fetal medicine at Washington University School of Medicine. And uh, sort of my um, area of interest is patient safety and quality. So, this is a great talk for me. It's a really significant talk for me. Um, I make a lot of protocols that deal with, um, with hemorrhage and look at, at metrics for hemorrhage and sort of, you know, trying to figure out how we can sort of decrease our risk for hemorrhage. Excellent. Tony, how about you? What's your practice look like? Yeah, so uh, I'm a maternal fetal medicine also, actually trained uh, under Dr. Ram Prasad. I'm a little bit younger. And uh, then we stayed on as faculty together. <laughs> yeah, very close. And then uh, I moved uh, back to Indiana. Uh, so I'm practicing maternal fetal medicine. Uh, I have a big role in education. I'm the vice chair of education for uh, OBGYN uh, here at Indiana University. And I think by nature of our specialty, we deal with a lot of complicated pregnancies. And of course, postpartum hemorrhage is a, a big thing that you have to be ready for. Okay, excellent. So maybe just like talking about some ground rules, some definitions, can we talk about, you know, what is postpartum hemorrhage? Roxanne, why don't we start with you? And then I'll let you guys kind of guide the conversation after we get some, you know, floor information established. So recently, um, ACOG has changed that definition to include blood loss greater than a thousand cc's. And so I think that's the, the, the number that we're sort of paying attention to. For vaginal delivery, though, even though greater than 500 may not change your hemodynamic state, it's still an important number to, to look at for vaginal delivery. So greater than 500 and less than 1,000 is still an important um, number to, to pay attention to if someone has reached that state of blood loss after vaginal delivery. One thing I want to point out for people that are listening that don't know, ACOG is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and they kind of set our, our ground rules for what we do in practice. And I kind of feel like many of us like get a chance to serve on those committees to interpret the evidence and, and make these protocols, but we really take them as, as guidance on what we do. When we trained, like when we talk about blood loss, like if you Hold remember- on, when, when, did, when did you guys train? Like how far back are we oh, talking? Tony, do you have to keep bringing that up? <laughs> <laughs> we are not dinosaurs. Well, we are not dinosaurs. That is true. But uh, why I bring it up is like, uh, if you remember, you know, an interventional radiologist back on when you're doing your clerkships through labor and delivery, like the nature of deliveries, like there is going to be blood loss at that time. And so when we uh, do them, we used to qualitatively measure blood. Like I actually Googled these pictures because I remember like looking at a lap sponge and then kind of having to make a guess on how much blood there is. And now there's been this movement where we have to do quantitative blood loss. Dr. Rompersad, you want to tell us what quantitative blood loss is? Gosh, quantitative blood loss, I think, is, is the bane of our uh, practice at our university. So you're right. Why is that? You know, bef bef before, because it was really easy to estimate blood loss. I think we looked at the bag, we looked at the laps, and we looked at the blood all around, and we're like, you know what? That's 500 cc's. And we all sort of learn what our 500 and what our 400 sort of look like. And quantitative blood loss is a little bit more labor intensive. Our nurses now have to gather everything that has blood on it and they have to weigh it. So they have to oh. know what it weighs prior to the delivery and what it weighs with, with blood. 
We also have to take into account amniotic fluid, which is also lost at the time of delivery. So it's not an easy thing to do. So, but but it's something that we've switched over because qualitative blood loss is probably not as accurate as quantitative blood loss. And I know that's controversial too. There's a lot of people that battle that back and forth. And I think even ACOG has changed a little bit on that where I don't, I don't think they're pushing, I think, quantitative blood loss, but I think a lot of other societies and a lot of what are called perinatal quality collaboratives in each state that, that follow maternal mortality and follow metrics like these quality, quality improvement metrics still use and are still pushing quantitative blood loss. So, so it's like a one gram is equivalent to one milliliter. So with the new definitions of it being like a thousand milliliters, whether it's a vaginal delivery or C-section now, like it's really up to the nurses to kind of help us out. Cause when you're in a C-section, um, sure. certainly you're focused on the field and you're going to rely on your nurses to measure that. What Roxanne was mentioning, I find interesting is that I, there's so many things that we do where we're trying to like be objective. I do think going forward, I definitely feel like, uh, even though it's uncomfortable learning this new thing, I feel like it makes sense. You know, we'll get better at measuring things. And I think that we'll be able to respond to changes better. And you're going to hear us use the term protocol a lot. I've shared this analogy with uh, Roxanne in the past, but I feel like labor and delivery, sometimes it's a lot like baseball. You know, it's a sporting uh, metaphor here is that there's a lot of times when you're just going to be sitting around and you'll be waiting for the ball to be hit to you. But when you have in your head, like if you're in center field and you know if that ball's hit to you, what base you're going to throw to, same with protocols, I know exactly where I'm going to go with what's next. You have to think about that each time because even though we have some predictors that we'll get into, like when it happens, you have to be ready in that moment and know where you're throwing. And this is why I like you, Tony, and why we're friends, because you have an analogy for everything, everything in medicine. And I love that because you break it down. And I love that. Do they all revolve around sports analogies? No, oh, that's uh, well, that is okay, actually I've I've been told to I check myself because I would say a few, you know, maybe a decade ago, they were very sports heavy. And then people said, not everyone catches those. So I will bring in some pop culture things and. All right. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So we, we, so we know some quantitative numbers for postpartum hemorrhage. Do you guys make any distinction between early, late postpartum hemorrhage? And can you talk about maybe, maybe some of the uh, timing issues regarding hemorrhage? And also, I mean, of course you're counting laps and you're trying to have an idea of like how much blood loss, but then there's also the clinical picture of, you know, what's the patient doing on the table or on the field? Sure. So acute and late are sort of how we um, differentiate the blood loss. And acute is within that first 24 hours and late is beyond that 24 hours and really up to 12 weeks is sort of mm -hmm. how we differentiate blood loss. Yeah, I think in terms of like uh, the definitions, this early and late, you know, that first 24 hours versus kind of after, they may kind of clue you in on on what's happening Um for the non-OBGYNs that are listening to this, we always talk about the four T's about the causes of postpartum hemorrhage. So now we know like it's going to be a thousand cc's, irregardless of delivery. We're going to quantitatively define it. But those four T's stand for tone, trauma, uh, tissue, and then thrombin is kind of the last one. And that's kind of the order. So when we say tone, we think about uterine atony. You've got a uterus that's been working and all of a sudden it doesn't want to. It doesn't want to clamp down. That's a big cause of that and the most common one. Trauma. So if you had a vaginal delivery that needed um, an operative delivery, maybe you did forceps, you may have a laceration that needs to be addressed. That's the second most common. And, you know, the pathways that you do to fix that are going to be different. The third one is tissue. You know, did you leave something behind? Is this like mm -hmm. a placenta accreta? Or maybe you had like an accessory lobe that's still in there. And then the last one, you know, the thrombin is just kind of defects in, in the coagulation pathways. So I think whether it's early or late, thinking about those four T's will kind of help triage in your head what you're going to do at that time. So you were saying that sometimes the timing drives you in a certain uh, differential. Like, so how does the timing play into like whether you think it's either, you know, atonic uterus versus trauma? Well, I, I think actually the clinical scenario that you're doing, like I think I'm much more hyper alert for possible lacerations if it's an operative delivery. If, if you're doing a vaginal delivery that's complicated for a, a large baby, you'll be ready for that. When you're in a C-section, you're right there, hands on the uterus. So you know right away whether there's uh, issues with tone. And that's kind of the first thing as you kind of work through there. So whether it happens in the first 24 hours or after the next 24 hours, I'm still thinking in that same pathway and what okay. I'm going to do. Gotcha. 
All right. So how do you go about uh, or you, we can do it a couple different ways. You can kind of like set the scene for like a standard patient and how you kind of work through this differential or work through your algorithm. Or you can just kind of talk about it in the ether either way. Roxanne, you want to start with you? Sure. So I think postpartum hemorrhage is always in every obstetrician's mm-hmm. mind after the birth of, uh, of a child. And so one of the things that, you know, that happens is that we start oxytocin um, after the delivery of that baby. And that's to help that uterus contract to allow us to decrease the blood loss. And that's regardless. That's regardless. That's all deliveries. Really, every delivery in the okay. United States who has an IV hooked up, most patients are on oxytocin already, but oxytocin is usually in the room and it's ready for that birth. And after that birth, it's initiated. Um, and we initiate it before the delivery of the placenta. And so we have that going. It's at a really high rate. And that is all to have that uterus contract down. And at the same time, while we're trying to deliver that that uterus, I'm sorry, that that placenta. Sure. We're watching, right? We're watching the the blood loss and it can pick up. And if it starts to pick up and it starts to increase and we're concerned about it, then I think then that sort of motiv- you know, mobilizes a lot of people in the room that maybe we're starting to have a hemorrhage. We expedite delivery of the placenta. And if that bleeding is ongoing, we start to feel that uterus. If it's atonic, meaning it doesn't feel, it feels soft, it doesn't feel contractile then we know likely this is an atonic uterus. And at- atony is the most common reason why patients have uh, postpartum hemorrhage. At the same time, while you're massaging, trying to firm that uterus up and you're increasing your oxytocin, you're looking around, you're making sure you're not having any lacerations. You're kind of going into your mind, Do I am I hitting any of those T's like Tony mm-hmm. mentioned? So do I have any lacerations? Do I think I could have retained tissue often if that bleeding is ongoing, we're bringing in the ultrasound, we're checking to make sure we don't see any evidence of retained products. And we're looking also at the blood. Is it clotting? So if we start to see clots, we don't think that patient's in DIC. We don't think the coagulation cascade is affected. And so what we're feeling and what we're seeing sort of helps to sort of guide us, that, guide that management. Okay. So, yeah. So, Tony, do you have anything to add on to that as far as like how your algorithm is a little bit different or how you're working through that process in your head and kind of what's happening in parallel as you're as you're evaluating your patient and as you're making changes to the situation? No, I, I mean, you know, we train similarly. So we have similar algorithms and, and how we're going to handle that. I think, you know, the preparedness is a big key. You know, They have these checklists now that many people will incorporate into their bundle where you can kind of risk stratify a patient before the delivery. Uh, and kind of when I explain things to medical students, you know, you think of a uterus as kind of like a balloon that needs to kind of come back together. So if someone's in a prolonged labor, maybe they have an infection that's going to keep it from coming down. They have multiple gestations where it's been overexpanded. Like I'm going to go in knowing I really am going to be concerned about that tone. Is this uterus going to come down? And the other two things, which I'm sure we'll touch on in terms of the treatment, like we prophylactically give oxytocin, but if we have issues with tone, we do have some other medications that we can use like methogen or hemabate, but it's always good before you get into that delivery to know like, does my patient have any contraindications to these medications? Like if she's got high blood pressure, I know I'm not going to give methogen. If she is an asthmatic, I'm not going to give hemabate to those patients. So I think going in, anticipating, you know, if you're going to have problems, it's a big thing. The other thing I'll say is, you know, the reproductive age patient are typically very healthy. You know, certainly we, in our line sure. of work, we, we take care of moms that are complicated, that have medical problems, but the majority of which, like this is the healthiest time. So if you have somebody that is manifesting tachycardia or hypotension, like be concerned because that's certainly abnormal at that time. Gotcha. Okay. So once you know you have postpartum hemorrhage, you're working through your differential I think it's easiest to talk about an atonic uterus. I mean, by far and away, the most common. We talked about starting oxytocin. We talked about the different, the other medications that you have potentially at your disposal. Can you talk about what other options that you have? Or at least let's talk about first, like the conservative side, like what you're doing for conservative management and then what you're thinking of in terms of like getting this patient ready for escalated level of, I don't know, care or treatment. Do you know what I mean by this? I'd love to hear your opinions on this, Roxanne. What are you guys doing? So like we're blowing past the atonic uterus. We've gone through our medication algorithms. What are you guys doing next? So in my mind, the things I'm thinking about is what stage of hemorrhage I am and what the medications I'm going to need and potentially what other, I think, actions I need to get done. So 
If we start with the medications like you mentioned, Tony, and I'm not getting any response and I have ongoing bleeding, then I'm going down in my head, what else am I supposed to do? The next thing for me to do, in, in, in addition to the medications that we use to cause contract, to make the uterus more contractile, then I'm thinking about TXA, the addition of TXA to help. And then if TXA is not helping, I'm thinking about um, tamponade. So in- introducing balloons to tamponade the uterus, tamponade the sites that are bleeding inside the uterus. And for us, that's a Bakri balloon. Hey, Roxanne, I don't mean to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I don't know what TXA is, and I'm, I suspect a couple other people don't. Yeah, so that's transexamic acid. Okay, gotcha. And we use it not only in the OB world, but also in the GYN world. So on hysterectomies with ongoing bleeding, we can use TXA. And, and GYN is not my world anymore, so Tony, remind me. I think people also use TXA for heavy menstrual bleeding, don't they? Yeah, and I, in terms of like how it actually works, like it prevents that fibrinogen getting broken down by plasminogen, so it works on that coagulation pathway. So technically, you can make these people hypercoagulable with that. There's a lot of studies that come out with TXA. I think like People use it for the postpartum hemorrhage that is like iris- like after three hours, like if you're still having ongoing bleeding. But I have come across in preparing for this talk, like they uh, have had some studies where they've kind of done it prophylactically as part of bundles for people that they're anticipating being at risk and that they may show um, some potential benefits. And I suspect that we'll continue to see more studies with TXA. But I, I wanted to uh, hear about Roxanne about the Bakri balloon, because I mentioned to her, we're doing something called JADA uh, at our institution. But tell us what the Bakri is, Roxanne. So the Bakri is essentially a balloon. I mean, think about it as a big Foley catheter, but larger. And we can instill 300 to 500 cc's in that Bakri balloon. We introduce it into the uterus and then we instill fluid to, to, to inflate that balloon. And it sits there for somewhere, somewhere between 12 and 24 hours, tamponading those sites trying to achieve hemostasis and to decrease blood loss. And so this is great because the JADA is is something new and it's a little bit different in terms of mechanism. We don't actually use it yet at our institution, but we're waiting. We're waiting to introduce it and to potentially study it because I think one of the things is that it was recently FDA approved, but we don't really have any studies in terms of comparison. Does it work better than the Bakri? Is the Bakri better? Because I think the Bakri is a little bit it is more cost effective in terms of price. And so I think we don't have those studies yet, but we are going to introduce that. Tony, do you have it at your institution? Yeah, we do. And we, so we've done like training with it. We we have to go. So the difference is with a Bakri, it's just a balloon that you put in, fill it up with saline. Again, like we're always thinking about, we want to minimize going back to these complicated surgeries uh, if you can avoid it. And certainly we always think about people preserving their fertility. So Bakri is just a bigger balloon that goes inside the uterus. You blow it up. It's nice because you can watch the amount of blood that's kind of coming through to know if you're still having ongoing bleeding. Eventually, you know, after a certain amount of time, 24 hours, uh, what I've done in the past, you deflate it and you can take it out. So the concept of the Jada is, you know, if you're thinking about an atonic uterus, you're placing in something, you know, a foreign body and blowing it up. It sounds maybe a little counterintuitive. Like if you're going to explain something to an engineer and say like, what would you actually do to get a uterus to clamp down? Would blowing it up be the way to do it? So that was kind of the concept of the Jada, which is essentially it's going to use pressure suction to to kind of keep things down. So you have to insert this device. It looks, I don't really have anything around here on my desk that looks like it, but it's a small- I don't think most most people won't be able to (laughs) see the desk anyway. (laughs) <laughs> uh, a prepared obstetrician yeah. would have had something, but you can <laughs> you can place it into the, the uterus and you actually have to hook it up to wall suction. Okay. And and so there's like metrics that they use to do that. It's been successful when we've done it, but you know, Roxanne's right. There's not as much, it's newer, so it, it doesn't have the studies behind it. But personally, I think it, it makes intuitive sense. And I think just having more options for things that, that can work would be good because you want to try to avoid some of these, certainly hysterectomies and other invasive things. Right, because sure. that's where we're going, right? If the medications don't work and these t- and tamponade doesn't work, is we're taking the patient either to the interventional radiology suite or we're going to the operating room. So that's our next big, I think, decision is where we're going. Sure. One of the things I want to talk about with uh, TXA, just for some of the IR listeners, TXA is something to keep on your radar if your institution uses it or it's part of their algorithm. If you do end up taking a patient back and you're going to be working in the blood vessels, knowing the patient is on TXA can create issues with 
basically like inducing thrombus in areas that we don't want to put it there. So we go in femoral access or radial access and TXA makes people hypercoagulable. You can have more clot formation in areas you do not want the clot. Okay, so now we're like getting to the point where uh, either the balloons aren't working, the meds aren't working, and you're now at a point where you either have to take them back to the OR, you take them back to the IR suite. Like what's going on in your head as to how patients get triaged to different spots? And, and just because you're going to the operating room doesn't mean it's hysterectomy, right? There's some other maneuvers you can do, but will you kind of talk about like how that decision tree happens? I'll tell you for me what sort of allows me to decide whether the patient's going to the IR or the operating suite is really the amount of blood. So persistent bleeding in someone that's hemodynamically stable, I'm going to take that patient to the interventional radiology suite. If that patient is not hemodynamically stable, they're unstable, and they have more brisk bleeding, their vital signs are abnormal, they're hypotensive, then I'm going to the operating room and I'm going to think about more operative maneuvers. So either you mentioned um, there are other things besides hysterectomy. A B-Lynch suture is one of those things that we can do. Essentially, we're compressing the uterus on itself to try to stop the bleeding. We can sometimes ligate the vessels, the uterine arteries going to um, the uterus, or we can ligate a little bit higher. A hypogastric ligation is sort of the, the next thing. And then if those things are not working and bleeding ensues and that patient becomes unstable and is becoming coagulopathic from that blood loss, then we're thinking about hysterectomy. It's sort of gotcha. my mind. Tony, what do you think? I, I think the word that you mentioned about stability is the big one. Like we would never want to send like a hemodynamically unstable patient off the floor to interventional radiology where they cannot be, you know, surgically reopened quickly. I think that would probably be the unsafe thing to do. You know, that's reserved for the person that has like maybe that persistent low level bleed. Like if you have a Bakri balloon and you continue to see blood come out the patient's vital signs are otherwise stable, but you're not really addressing the bleeding. Like that's a good person for that. I also think like, you know, certainly C-sections, you know, if you have like a complicated C-section and they're hemodynamically unstable, like going back in, seeing, you know, where you actually closed off your hysterotomy, you know, that makes sense because sometimes you can have those extensions and that's where you're bleeding from. Not necessarily a hysterectomy, but just kind of reapproximating those areas first. So one of the things I want to dig in on, though, is, and I found this, like when you're talking to, like you guys are super high level operators at big institutions, do a lot of those work, but not every OBGYN is created equal or, or not all resources available. So like just not every IR is created equal, not every OBGYN is created equal. Can you speak to that a little bit? Is that, are there some operators who would feel uncomfortable like with unstable patients? Or sometimes I'll hear from OBGYN colleagues, like it would be they're very nervous about taking a patient back because they're like, oh, I just feel like it's going to be a hostile pelvis. It, things like this um, kind of come up into, I think, the people's decision tree. So can different obstetricians kind of end up in different places? Yeah. Well, I would never want an obstetrician or really any physician do something that they are uncomfortable with. So I think a lot of, you know, it was specifically thinking about hysterectomies, you know, a cesarean hysterectomy. I think like the planning stages are very important because at our institution, you know, we actually have GYN oncologists. You know, those are the mm -hmm. people that do the most surgery. Like typical day for Roxanne and myself, we are not in the OR all day. Sure. You know, we're seeing patients, we're doing ultrasound. So we like having people that are, you know, really good at at knowing surgical planes and distorted anatomy, because that's what it is at the time of a C hist. So planning is great. Certainly there are gonna be times when the instability happens and it they're not there like it happens. So you want to make sure your labor and delivery is covered by staff that is capable of doing that. Okay. What do you think, Roxanne? So we take a lot of transfers. And so this comes up definitely. And for most obstetricians out in er smaller areas and small institutions, I think the thing that they worry about mostly is their blood bank, is that uh, they are not equipped to have, you know, to transfuse someone sometimes more than six units, which, you know, it's really unfathomable to me because we have this big blood bank and we can do, you know, we have massive transfusion protocols. And so I think that's what most of those obstetricians are thinking about. Sure. And so they may have the balloon tamponades, and, but they may not have interventional radiology also. And so for, for them, sure. hysterectomy is sort of the, the sort of the end point is removing that. And then we often get a lot of those patients transferred to us because they can still have ongoing bleeding even after hysterectomy. And so they need to come to you know, these quaternary centers like we what we have. And and so, I mean, it's it's definitely something to think about when you're in a smaller area in a small hospital. 
in Indiana, in many states have, you know, these levels of care where like you have, you know, the tertiary hospital and everything kind of funnels up. And so it's kind of up to individual states to figure out what is safe to say at different places. I feel like radiology plays a big role in some of these cases because, you know, when we talk about the four T's, those are things that are going to happen in the moment. They can happen anywhere. But as our like C-sections rise and we have like these compli- the placenta accreta spectrum, which I'm sure we'll talk about, in anticipation of those cases, like those are the ones I think that you can refer them to the centers within your state that are actually experts at that. And then that way you have time to get the blood available and all that. It, it, the blood bank thing is definitely, I think, future states. Like I've been just hearing talks about shortages with things mm-hmm. and then not being able to give O negative blood for some of these massive transfusions. So it'll be something to, to keep an eye on down the road. Okay. How important is having a massive transfusion protocol? Like for y'all's practice, I mean, it seems like that's kind of a cornerstone of managing this issue. It's definitely key for us. I mean, we ha- we take care of a lot of high-risk patients. And I think Tony mentioned the placenta creta spectrum, and we have a fair amount of that because our, our cesarean section rates are increasing. So we see a lot of previas and a lot of placenta creta spectrum. And so it's very important. I think we keep that in mind every time we have patients that sort of fit in that high-risk category. That are coming in for delivery, this patient's likely to bleed. We're going to have to type and cross this patient, and likely, you know, we may need to to activate massive transfusion protocol. So, very, very important, I think, for us. And because we're a referral center and we get a lot of transfers, it's important. I also think um, I always there's like these Venn diagrams on how you know to be a good educator these days. You you have to have your content knowledge. You know, we've all gone to learn about our specialty. If you wanted to impart education. To, you have to know pedagogy and how to actually teach adult learners. When we talk about protocols, I feel like with our current state of medicine, where things are so specialized and you just have to be able to reflexively go down these fast pathways, especially in fast paced specialties, that way of teaching is like so important. So like massive transfusion protocols are really protocols for like any clinical condition. I feel like it's so important. And I think like medical students now, certainly residents, like I'm sure like residents 50 years ago, in terms of how they learned that, they had book knowledge that they had and then they applied sure. it. But now they did not have a pocketbook of protocols that we have and continually update all the time. So how about uh, just d- dipping into the interventional radiology side? Do you guys both have access to interventional radiology 24-7, 365? We do. And at our institution, we um, sort of name our activations differently. So a level one activation is what trauma uses for a patient that comes in and and needs uh, IR. We use that same level of activation, though, for a mom, just because our our moms are younger and and these procedures are life-saving. So even though our patients are hemodynamically stable, we'll use that same level one activation in our institution. It gets everyone mobilized. People are in the suite quicker. We're lucky also because in our tower, interventional radiology has a suite two floors down. And so we can bring that patient down and into the IR suite really quickly. Okay. Tony, how about y'all? Yeah. I mean, it's very similar. Um, that's on there. I, I do feel like with interventional radiology, like we do rely on them. But again, I, we are only going to send like stable bleeding patients, but it's not like we have, I, I personally have not been in their suite. So I don't know what it looks like it's over there. I maybe have done it once when I was back in St. Louis, but I almost feel like there there are colleagues, but they're a little bit separate. So it just goes back that we don't want to send that unstable patient to make that journey. Sure. I guess so. Neither one of you guys have. Um, there's no hybrid suites in which y'all uh, do any collaborative practice with like balloon occlusions and C sections in the same suite or anything. We've done some balloon occlusions for patients with placenta accreta spectrum. You know, I think the data has not panned out, and sure. so it's not really. I think most people no longer think it's evidence-based to start with these balloon occlusions. But I will say that we have a couple of our oncologists that really like that. And so patients will go down to the suite and then come back up and then we inflate them if we need to. Um, okay. But we are not using them, I think, preoperatively. Oh, I wanna, I'm curious, Roxanne. So preoperative, what about stents, ureteral stents? Are you guys using that a lot? I think it depends. It depends yeah. on the on the GYN oncology surgeon. I think it's rare, but there are some depending on sort of what that imaging looks like on MRI or what we think on ultrasound that may want those ureteral stents placed prior to the surgery. And it, it's such a, I think, a surgeon preference. You definitely yeah, see okay. different practices based on the surgeon. 
And are the GYN surgeons, are they putting them in themselves or they get help with like urology? No, we're pu- they're putting it in themselves. Okay. At, at her institution, at ours, we have urologists that'll put in stents. But again, these are the ones you are anticipating having problems. Sure. Right. Your placenta accreta spectrum is not necessarily the ones that happen in the moment. Of course. Okay. So actually, I'll leave it to Tony. Like, where do you want to take it next in terms of like you have a patient either going to the operating room or going to IR suite and either way you can get a good outcome? Well, I'm curious. Obviously, we know like definitively hysterectomy is going to happen. But if someone has a uterine artery embolization via our great colleagues in the VIR suite, what do you tell them about future pregnancies and, and what to, what they should be worried about? So oftentimes, like in, in my experience, when so we, I work at a big obstetrical hospital in New Orleans, we do a lot of uh, or OB does a lot of deliveries. And so it's not an uncommon problem. But to be honest, like this conversation doesn't really happen in the moment. It's all emergent. Mm-hmm. We're coming in, in the middle of the night or the middle of the day and everything's happening very quickly. And so afterwards, a lot of the talk is just like, hey, you're OK. You're through this. You're healthy. You're happy. But there's no good data to steer them in the right direction. So I'll kind of defer to some of the uterine artery embolization for fibroid data. And yeah. I just say, yeah, I'll just say that, you know, this didn't help this. What we did for that emergency isn't going to help you to get pregnant, but it's not a form of birth control. And you certainly will have an option for pregnancy, but it's it's not doing you any favors in terms of fertility. That's interesting, Chris. So we actually had, uh, we differentiate and what what is used, I think, for our patients and our, at least by our radiology colleagues, they'll use gel foam often, I think, for our patients who... Um, who have who desire future pregnancies, but I'm told that there's an increased risk for for bleeding with with gel foam. But we tend to use gel foam if pe- patients desire future fertility, and then something more permanent. It sounds like when we think they're done with childbearing. But you're right, we don't often know, and so when we don't know, everyone gets gel foam here at our, at least at our institution. Yeah, but you're you're right, Chris. Like we we see them kind of afterwards. Like you you guys help us out, and it's successful. You know, upwards ninety percent of the time. And then afterwards, they're going to ask, you know, can I still get pregnant? And the answer is yes. But you're right. Like looking at this, there is like the UAE data after fibroids as well as postpartum hemorrhage. I still think those patients will be watched very closely to make sure that, you know, growth is fine in their subsequent pregnancies. And I think being hyper alert, not just with the UAE, but what other procedures were done. Was there a C-section? Was there any type of um, manipulation of the inside of the uterus? Like, am am I going to be worried about adhesive placenta down the road? I think I'll be considering that. Right. Um, And going back to like the gel foam, I I thought that might be kind of in the weeds for you guys. But in terms of like embolization material, every every operator has their own algorithm when they're kind of like looking at postpartum hemorrhage, really hemorrhage and trauma in general. I think if you polled a lot of interventional radiologists, most people are going to use gel foam in the uterine arteries. Unless like you saw like a pseudoaneurysm or an AV fistula or something that was a little bit more indicator that like you had like a bad vascular injury. I think sometimes those will be treated with coils um, and then maybe followed up with some gel foam. But I think by and large that people are just kind of go to gel foam. We're very comfortable with it in the trauma setting. It's quick. It's easy. It's cheap. And so I think most people use gel foam and maybe they're thinking about fertility, but I think a lot of people that's just their default to treat it, whether you're in the liver or the uterus. It's a great point. It, it came up um, because one of our fellows was concerned, I think, because I think one of the permanent embospheres w- was used in a prior patient. And I think it came up as, what should we tell her about? Is there a risk for placenta accreta spectrum in the future? Is there a risk for infertility in the future? And I think it got a lot of people thinking and talking. And you know, it was great because both our radiology colleagues and our high-risk OB colleagues kind of came together and I think what we were told is that for them, just like you mentioned, I think gel foam is probably going to be the default, um, but there is this potential increased risk for like a, a, a rebleeding, I guess, is what I would say. Yes. So gel foam, temporary. So sometimes patients can rebleed. Anecdotally, I mean, you know, we don't publish our data and um, we don't do so many that it would warrant a publication, but usually gel foam, lock it in with gel foam, and then, you know, it allows the patient to give themselves a chance to heal, and then it gives you guys a chance to do your thing. And then rarely are we taking people back uh, either to the operating room after uterine artery embolization or back to the angio suite. Yeah, but that's what I was going to ask is if they fail a uterine artery embolization and they're still having ongoing bleeding, I think the next step would be going in, uh, if you have not already done that, looking at your C-section score, if it happens to be a C-section, preparing for a possible hysterectomy, 
In your experience, how often have you had to do it more than once on the same patient? Uh, uterine artery immobilization? Yeah. Do you ever go back take, in? I've okay. never had to take them back in. Um, I, I say that. There was one time we took a patient back to the angio suite where we did. So we went. Um, I didn't have a CTA beforehand, which isn't my standard practice to get a CTA. I'll just take them from wherever they're located to the IR suite. We'll do an um, angiography of the uterine arteries. And I didn't see anything, which is not uncommon, still embolized with gel foam. And then we didn't, the patient was hemodynamically stable, but it was still downtrending like it was an arterial bleed. And so I took him back to the angio suite, did a flush aortogram, and it was actually a bleed coming off um, basically a a different branch that was applying like a round ligament artery. So it was off like the external, off the inferior epigastric artery. So it was really kind of on me. I missed the bleed. But, you know, if you play the odds, if you embolize the uterine arteries, you're going to be successful in 90 plus percent of the patients. But they weren't responding. We got a CTA, showed the bleed. And so I, I knew where to go in on the next round. And so some practitioners will actually do a flush aortogram to kind of get a lay of the land and help direct their catheterization after that. My practice previously had been to just go straight to the uterine arteries and embolize those, whether I saw anything or not. Yeah, my experience um, just from the IR colleagues that the success rates are very high. So that's the exception. We're like fighter pilots. We think the success of all of our stuff is very <laughs> high. Like, like if you ask fighter pilots how often they hit their targets, it's like double what they actually hit. Now, now we're talking, I'm a huge Top Gun fan, so I'm ready for this podcast to, <laughs> to start talking about Maverick. Yeah. Well, because you know we, we've talked about interventional radiology. When I think about um, the anticipation of a postpartum hemorrhage, like I think it's worthwhile to talk about placenta accreta spectrum, and then specifically the diagnosis, ultrasound and MRIs. Um, and again, like Roxanne, we worked together, so I know what it was before. Are you guys using MRIs routinely? What, what, I mean, certainly everyone's getting ultrasounds. Um, we can talk about what we look for, but what about MRIs? We're not using them routinely, but there are some cases that we are using them. Um, I think and and that's so controversial because I think as MFMs, all the MFMs think we just need to stick with the ultrasound, but our oncology folks sometimes are pushing for that MRI, even though I feel like a lot of times, and no disrespect, but I think that they overcall the MRI because I think no one wants to miss, obviously, a placenta creative spectrum. And so I think maybe the way it, when it's helpful is when we think it's a procreta and we think there's bladder invasion and we have to prepare for that. Maybe in those cases, it's helpful, but we don't routinely use MRI. Do you guys use routine MRI? So we have a pediatrician, Dr. Brandon Brown, who uh, we do a lot of MRIs for fetal indications, and he actually has grant funding to offer patients. So we were getting a lot of MRIs with ultrasound. We actually had something looking at our own thing. There are so many studies that compare the predictive values of ultrasound and, and MRIs. I find those studies helpful just to remind me what to look for that are on there. So like, I feel like the ultrasound criteria, you know, the things that we look for, we look for placental lakes, hypervascularity behind the bladder. Like I always tell a med student, like uh, back in the days when we used to make bladder flaps, like you'd never do that if there were a bunch of vessels behind it. So if you see a bunch of vessels behind there, you should definitely be concerned. That retroplacental clear space is another one. If you see like bulging into the bladder, that's bad. So their MRI colleagues kind of made like their cutoffs uh, that are on there. I feel like not routinely, I don't think that it routinely, but like you're mentioning, there probably are going to be some select cases. And certainly if the person that is going to operate on it, like if it'll help their surgical planning, by all means, uh, we're fortunate to have the ability to offer that to our patients. I'm sure that's not the case everywhere. You know, I think part of it too is what is MRI with gadolinium the best sort of imaging and is that what we should be doing? But we often don't use gadolinium and, and in pregnancy, but the group in San Diego, right, they use a lot of gadolinium. And so a lot of the studies with MRI or use, using MRI comes from the, from that group. Tony, I'm just wondering if you guys are using gadolinium with your MRIs or are you guys going with that contrast? Yeah. Um, so it's up to what Brandon does. I'm pretty sure it's without contrast for these indications. Um, I'd have to double check with him, to be honest. Okay. Who's Brandon? Is he the G1? Brandon Brown. So he's, he's a pediatrician um, oh, with okay. a special interest which I feel is kind of nice that you have like a dedicated person. You know, we have that ability because we use MRIs uh, not necessarily for placental issues, but for a lot of our fetal conditions to really kind of delineate surgical planning for them. And we now have like fetal interventionalists. So I'm sure like that'll be kind of a bigger thing um, that we'll be able to offer our patients. Gotcha. 
All right. So whether you use ultrasound or MRI, do you guys want to kind of just talk a little bit more broadly about, you know, accreta spectrum and how you guys handle that? So um, we suspect placenta accreta spectrum when uh, patients have previous. And so that's the first thing. We see a preview. We start looking at that interface. So we look for that loss of that myometrial interface that Tony mentioned. We look for these lacunae in the placenta. And then we look at the vascularity at the bladder interface. And some of those things can sort of uh, clue us in that maybe this patient has placenta accreta. And once we um, diagnose placenta accreta spectrum, then we have a multidisciplinary team that we mobilize to start talking about these cases and then for surgical planning. It's a group made up of our high-risk OB docs and our um, GUN oncologist, and then people who have an interest in imaging. And so we take that patient through their pregnancy and we bring them in for antenatal steroids because most of these patients are delivered early. And we bring them in, we um, do that surgical planning, get them typed and crossed, and then we get them to the operating room. And usually, I think with this multidisciplinary approach, we're more successful, I think, than someone coming off the street with an un, you know, undiagnosed placenta accreta spectrum. I think you can definitely see a difference in blood loss and a difference in morbidity. So knowing ahead of time and having patients being imaged um, is definitely helpful, especially when they have a history of a prior cesarean section. And so I think when We'll have Tony sort of uh, tell us his experience too, but when patients have a prior cesarean section and they have that previa, and once their cesarean section starts to increase in terms of numbers, and that risk can be as high as, as 60%, and so it's a pretty significant risk, actually. And so it's really important for us to try to keep our cesarean rates down if, 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 if we can. Yeah, there's a very important study that came out in 2006. Um, Silver is the, the primary author, and uh, it kind of really enforced like the implications of having a previa in addition to like that C-section, you know, cause if you have like a, a manipulation of your uterus, a myomectomy, something that disturbs that, that endometrial layer, that nidobox layer, that's going to lead to adhesive placenta. And it makes sense. You know, the more C-sections you have, your risk is going to go up. This study that Silver and their group, it was like over 30,000 patients that they looked at and they stratified it with whether you had a previa or not. So if you did not have a placenta previa, and let's say you're going in for your fourth C-section, so you've had three prior C-sections going in for your fourth, your risk of an accreta was 2%. If you're going in for your fourth C-section, you had three prior C-sections and you had a previa, your risk is over 60%. So that's a huge difference just based on where that placenta is. And to me, that makes sense. You know, If you have a fundal placenta that's far away from the scar, okay, that's probably less risky than one that's right there that could potentially grow into it. So even before you've laid that probe on the patient to look at an ultrasound to see if it's got some of these clinical characteristics, your clinical history, just taking that will, will kind of clue you in how worried you should be. And are both of you guys doing all your own ultrasound imaging? Like, is it, it is, is it farmed out to the radiology department or is it all in-house? And by in-house, I mean inner department of the OBs. Ours are done by our MFMs and then our radiologists get involved when we have to do MRI. Okay. How about you, Tony? That's the same way. We, we're very ultrasound based. So yeah, these are our own patients. You know, I think relying on radiology, they probably handle some GYN scans, um, certainly like overnight um, with that. But for anything like obstetric related, uh, and certainly these placenta ones all come to us. Gotcha. So I know that now we can't see anybody, but Tony, I'll, I'll <laughs> leave it to you to where you want to take it next. All right. So let's think future state. We've covered Roxanne what things are like now, what are we What are we working on with Jada and everything, and we have the protocols, like in specifically with postpartum hemorrhage, what, what do you think we need to be cognizant of? Where do you think things are going? What do you think we could potentially do to offset this in the future? Gosh, Tony, that's a really good question and kind of blown my mind here. I, I don't know besides <laughs> that tamponade and, and what else we can do. You know what? Actually, let's take, let me take that back. I think one of the things that's really exciting that potentially could help us are these devices that engineers are looking at that are wearable, that potentially could let us know about the hemodynamic state before we're behind the eight ball, because that's the issue, right? Is that oftentimes when we, we recognize it, that patient could be already behind the eight ball and we're trying to catch up. And so I think that would be like an amazing thing. So patients would come in, they would be laboring or they could be in the operating room 
and they would wear some sort of optical device that's looking at that volume and hemodyna- hemodynamic states, and that could sort of clue us in, hey, your patient, you know, is going to be in trouble, you know, start doing these things potentially. Maybe you need to start thinking about transfusion ahead of time, or maybe you need to start, you know, thinking about ligating vessels or, you know, being more expedient with your surgery. But that, I think, could be, a f- you know, something in the future that could really help us. Yeah, I, I love to think about, you know, kind of these moonshots, you know, and I think that's how you get you know, these big developments, not just in medicine, but in anything, like it's usually something that's a little bit outside of the box. I love the idea of like personalized medicine. And that's just one aspect of it. Certainly in the most acute of settings that you can kind of keep track of that person's vital signs before they get too sick. I think like in terms of the etiology for these postpartum hemorrhages, we've had such a focus on create a diagnosis and preparation. Boy, I wish there was a way to prevent it. Like if there was some way, maybe like after a delivery that you could apply something on the inside of a non-pregnant uterus that can kind of reestablish a stable wall internally, again, pie in the sky, that may be something uh, 50 years down the road, somebody will be able to figure out, but I think that'd be kind of cool. That's nice. So let me ask you guys this. A lot of our audience is um, interventional radiology, uh, vascular surgery, uh, interventional cardiology. And are there any are there any things that you wish your interventional radiology colleagues knew or any references that you wish that they had at their disposal to like kind of help you take care of these patients? Like, does anything come to mind in terms of like articles or, um, you know, ACOG guidelines that are available? Yeah. So um, there was a New England Journal of Medicine article that came out last year. Um, it's Beanstalk. Dr. Beanstalk is the primary author, but it has a couple of people that we know, Dr. E.K., Dr. Hupchin. It's a great review uh, with where our current state is. Um, I think that's a great reference to have. But I think an interventional radiologist always having the most up-to-date ACOG postpartum hemorrhage is a great thing to hold on to. It gets updated every few years, but you, you'll you intuitively know like what obstetricians are thinking about in dealing with these cases. And they'll always have areas on like uterine artery embolizations using radiology to diagnose things, you'll know like what we're are supposed to be thinking about. Gotcha. Um, Roxanne, anything to add? Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that is is really helpful is really collaboration. OBs and MFMs love collaboration. And I feel like collaborating with our, our IR colleagues in radiology and making protocols so we know what's new on our side, what's new on your side and coming together, I think works really well. We do it at WashU, and I think we do it really well. We have built protocols together. There's, you know, people in radiology that are really interested in postpartum hemorrhage. And so I think that that is really good and really helpful for us when we collaborate and we sort of know what you're thinking, what we're thinking. So that would be my big plug. Okay, excellent. All right, guys, anything that we left, uh, any stone left unturned, anything that we didn't cover? No, I think this was a a nice review. This was uh, fun. All right, good. Um, glad you guys enjoyed it. And to our audience, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast but want more, please check out the show notes on this episode. I'm going to work hard with uh, Roxanne and Tony and make sure that we can upload uh, or at least link to all the articles that we talked about. Those can be found at www.backtable.com. Special thanks to all the people at Backtable who make those show notes happen. It takes an effort. And what else? Oh, we're offering some free CME. I think this podcast will be a part of that. So if you want to get some CME, go ahead and click on the green link and that'll take you through the process. We really appreciate y'all's support and we'll catch you next time on the Back Table Podcast. Roxanne, Tony, thanks for coming on. Thank you guys. It was fun. Thank you.